Welcome back to Harbor Unbox. Today, I've got yet another RTX 4090 to check out. And this time, it's the colorful eye game, RTX 4090 Vulcan OC-V. And yeah, this one wins the award for the longest, most convoluted name of any RTX 4090 we've seen to date. So hopefully that's not its only claim to fame. Actually, no, it's not. It also comes in the biggest box we've seen. In all seriousness, the Vulcan OC is a really impressive looking RTX 4090 with a few neat features such as the detachable iGame Smart LCD and light board. But let's start by going over the external design, dimensions, and of course, the weight. Weight wise, this thing is a juggernaut. It's 6% heavier than the massive ASUS Tough Gaming at 2,475 grams, making it the heaviest graphics card I've ever come across. Thankfully though, Colorful has included a support arm to help handle that weight, though it's similar in design to that of the support pillar provided by ASUS with the Tough Gaming, so it's more of a janky solution in my opinion when compared to the bracket that Gigabyte uses. I'm not really a fan of these standalone arms or poles, whatever you want to call them. They just look very makeshift and aren't exactly fixed in a place, but it's certainly better than nothing when you have almost two and a half kilograms worth of graphics card. In terms of dimensions, the Vulcan OC measures 337 millimeters long, 143 millimeters tall from the PCIe slot, or 175 millimeters tall with the iGame Smart LCD installed in the upright position, and then it is 70 millimeters thick. So it's a little shorter in terms of height and length than the Tough Gaming, which should help with case compatibility. Front on, the Vulcan OC looks aggressive, almost as if some design inspiration has been taken from past ASUS Strix graphics cards. The fans also look familiar with the blades encased in an outer ring, which Colorful call their Hurricane Scythe blades. Basically, they look like Axial Tech fans with a few minor modifications. That's fine though, I really like the design as it makes it very difficult to break or damage the fan blades. Now, although Colorful has gone with a plastic fan shroud, something I didn't like about the Gigabyte Gaming OC, the design here looks more premium, probably helped by a number of metallic highlights. Embedded in the shroud are three 100mm fans, but unlike the ASUS and Gigabyte models that I've already looked at, there's no counter rotation here with the outer fans, rather all three fans spin in the same clockwise direction. Moving around to the outer edge of the Vulcan OC, I really like and appreciate how simple Colorful have kept things here. The mandatory GeForce RTX branding is present, but it looks good in white. And they haven't made the mistake of trying to plaster the thing in as many branding opportunities as possible. So it says GeForce RTX, and that's it. Now what they have done is given you the ability to install the iGame Smart LCD or light bar here. Centrally located are eight gold pins, which allow either the light board or iGame Smart LCD to be connected. And either device is held in place using powerful magnets. Now, as gimmicky as you might feel these features are, I'm happy to report that the design and build quality is excellent. Both snap into place with ease, and there is a great deal of versatility here. The LCD, for example, can be mounted vertically or horizontally, and if you wish to use the light bar instead, but would still like to utilize the LCD, Colorful has included a USB adapter that will allow you to mount it under your monitor, for example, or perhaps even somewhere else within your case. Then with the iGame Center software, it's possible to control the light board and or LCD, showing system information for the GPU, CPU, and even an image of your choosing. The quality of the LCD is quite good, so the readouts are very clear and easy to read. It's a very neat feature indeed. Alternatively, if you don't wish to use the colorful software, there's the included RGB sync cable that can connect to your motherboard. And this connector is found next to the 16 pin PCIe 5.0 power. Other than that, like all the other RTX 4090s, there's a boatload of fins visible here. Now at the rear end of the card, so the end opposite the I.O. panel, we do find some small iGame branding, but it looks nice enough, and in fact it's a shame that most will never really get to see this angle of the card once it's installed, as it does look surprisingly good. There's also some mounts here for a support bracket, like what Gigabyte include with the gaming OC, but sadly Colorful doesn't include a similar bracket. Then at the opposite end, so now the I.O. end, we find a triple slot mounting bracket complete with three DisplayPort 1.4a ports and a single HDMI 2.1a port. There's also a one key overclock button, which as the name suggests, automatically overclocks the GPU for you, 
raising the boost clock by 4% to 2625 megahertz. When active, the button will light up blue, and after a quick reset, the new BIOS is loaded, so it's quite a neat dual BIOS type feature. Now, I should note that the stock BIOS runs at the default 450 watt power limit, but this can be maxed out at 480 watts. Then with the one key overclock BIOS loaded, it has a 515 watt power limit by default, and this can be increased to 550 watts. So while that's plenty of headroom, the Gigabyte Gaming OC and ASUS Tough Gaming both went to 600 watts. So perhaps they're better candidates for those of you looking at throwing on a water block, for example. Now, moving around to the back side of the card, we find a stylish looking aluminium backplate with the typical pass-through cutout at the end. It's a nice looking design, though it is somewhat spoiled by the rather large stickers that I reckon would have been better positioned under the base of the card, near the PCIe connector, rather than spoil the backplate. And then finally, I should note that all the materials here are constructed using aluminium, so it is a very high quality backplate. Now, time to take the cooler off, and this is a pretty straightforward job. The removal of just a dozen screws is required to pop the cooler off, and then once they're removed, you then need to disconnect the fan and LED cables, and then gently pry the heatsink off. A bit of lifting pressure here is required to break the seal created by the thermal pads. And doing so reveals a PCB which measures 230 millimeters long and 135 millimeters tall. So quite compact given the overall dimensions of this graphics card. Mounted on the PCB is a UPI UP9512U PWM controller, along with a UPI UP9512Q controller. The Q version is used to power the GDDR6X memory, driving four Alpha and Omega 55 amp power stages. Then for the GPU power delivery, Colorful has gone with 20 Alpha and Omega 55 amp power stages, providing a massive 24 plus 4 MOSFET design. Now, moving over to the cooling side of things, Colorful has a remarkably similar cooler to that of the other brands, and in a way, actually looks like an improved version of what we saw on the Tough Gaming. As you'd expect, there's a copper vapor chamber which makes direct contact with the GPU die and it is nickel plated. Then we have nine 8mm thick nickel plated copper heat pipes which move heat away from the vapor chamber and into the array of many aluminium fins. The big upgrade here from the Tough Gaming Cooler is the use of much thinner thermal pads, especially for the GDDR6 memory. Colorful has used aluminium plates to help reduce the gap and I expect this will have a positive effect on memory cooling performance. Overall though, it is a massive, heavy, but very well made cooler that should perform to a high standard. The only surprise here was the backplate which doesn't feature any thermal pads and these can be used to remove built up heat from the rear side of the PCB and turn the backplate into a heat spreader, but here it's just a backplate. So a bit of a missed opportunity there by Colorful. Overall though, an impressive cooler that appears well built and therefore I expect it will cool the Vulcan OC graphics card very well. So to find out, let's go over the stress test results. Here's a look at how the Vulcan OC operates after an hour of Hitman 3 at the 4K resolution using the maximum in-game quality settings. These temperatures were recorded in a 21 degree room installed inside an ATX case with the doors closed. Here we see the GPU hotspot hit 74 degrees, though the fan speed was reasonably low at 1950 RPM, and this generated 41 decibels of noise. The average GPU temperature peaked at 65 degrees, and the memory at 70 degrees. Now time for some overclocking. By default, the Vulcan OC has a 450 watt limit, and with a maximum 106% power limit, the BIOS will allow you to go as high as 480 watts. However, for overclocking, we used the one key OC mode, which switches to a 515 default BIOS with a 550 watt max range. This allowed my Vulcan OC to reach a stable core frequency of 2,925 megahertz, which resulted in an average power draw of 505 watts, while the memory peaked at 24 gigabits per second. This increased the GPU hotspot temperature to 80 degrees and the memory temperature to 74 degrees. That said, the fan speed had now ramped up to 2,150 RPM, and now you could quite easily hear the graphics card over the case fans, but it wasn't alarmingly loud, so even overclocked to the max, the Vulcan OC was very manageable. Now, when compared to the ASUS Tough Gaming, Gigabyte Gaming OC, and NVIDIA's Founders Edition, we see that the Vulcan OC is very competitive when it comes to the average GPU temperature. Both stock and overclocked, it was comparable to the ASUS and Gigabyte models at a similar operating volume of 41 decibels for the stock fan speed. The hotspot temperatures were also very similar. Here the Vulcan OC peaked at just 75 degrees stock and 80 degrees when overclocked. 
This is a reasonable improvement over the default operating behaviors of the Founders Edition model, which does its best to avoid high fan speeds. Then for the GDDR6X memory temperatures, the Vulcan OC sits between the Gigabyte Gaming OC and ASUS Tough Gaming thanks to the aluminium heat spreaders which allow for thinner thermal pads. Still not quite as good as what Gigabyte achieved, but certainly good enough for maximum memory overclocking. As mentioned previously in the Tough Gaming review, the overclocking results are pretty boring as Nvidia does heavily limit what their partners can do when it comes to operating parameters. So basically like all RTX 49s, there's only around 5-6% to more performance that can be extracted. That's it. It's basically not worth the effort in my opinion, but if you want a few extra frames while risking stability, then go for it. It's a real shame that stuff like the voltages can't be increased, even just a little bit, that'd help unlock additional performance. Instead, Nvidia has limited their partners to the point where high-end, exciting graphics cards, they're just really pointless, and AMD for that matter is really not much better. So in many instances, you might as well just buy base models, though I don't believe there is a Vulcan non-OC version, so this, I guess, is the premium slash base model. They do have a liquid-cooled model, which you know maybe we'll get to look at in the future, but my point is there's not too much point at least what we've seen so far, on spending big money on premium RTX 4090 graphics cards. I have to admit, I didn't really know what to expect with the colourful iGame RTX 4090 Vulcan OC-V, other than a graphics card with an awkwardly long name. The last time I reviewed a colourful iGame graphics card was the RTX 3070 version. I was pretty disappointed with the product. It was loud, the thermals weren't good, it was kind of ugly, and there were no interesting features to speak of you would have really been better off buying basically any other model. The RTX 4090 version, on the other hand, is very impressive. Now, I know visually it won't appeal to everyone, but in terms of features, design, and performance, it is very good. For example, the iGame Smart LCD and Lightboard, they're neat features that work well and give the product an interesting visual appeal, while also providing potentially useful information. Now, although the FPS performance isn't anything special, as all 4090s are remarkably similar in that regard, the thermal performance was strong for both the GPU and GDDR6X memory, while the operating volume was quite low. The one key OC is a nice feature, and the 550 watt BIOS is great. Though it would have been nice if it went as high as 600 watts, like we saw with the ASUS and Gigabyte models, still 550 watts should be plenty of headroom for most of you. Overall a good product, and although I can't comment on its value at this point in time, it is an RTX 4090, so I can't imagine value is a priority here anyway. Point is, it works well and has some unique features that do help it stand out from the pack. And that is going to do it for this one. If you like the video, you know what to do. Subscribe for more content, especially if you like these 4090 reviews, because we do have the ASUS Strix model to look at, I think, next. Uh, there's also the MSI Supreme X, and no doubt there'll be a few more 4090s turn up before we get through, well, all the 4090s that we're going to cover. Then, of course, there'll be 4080s, RDNA 3, plenty more graphics card reviews, I guess, is the point. But yes, thank you for watching. Uh, if you'd like to support the channel directly, we do have Floatplane Patreon. Links for those are in the video description. You'll get access to our exclusive Discord server for Harbour Unbox members. Monthly live stream to myself get together and do that at least once a month. Q&As, behind the scenes content. Tim's moved into his new studio now. So a lot of cool stuff there. If you're interested, check it out. But if not, that is perfectly fine. And again, I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.